Hello, I'm Emma Louise Coffey and you're welcome to The Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. Farm succession can be a difficult process to navigate and on this week's episode, Farm Structure Specialist Gordon Pepperidge shares his top tips on best practice in succession planning. And I first asked him about partnership structures for families. There's a number of uh, opportunities there available to, to young farmers and their, their father or mother. I suppose the main one that I suppose we're looking at there are family farm partnerships and they're a registered partnership where a father and mother come together with their either their son or their daughter. These, these partnerships are an arrangement where they have a joint bank account and all the inputs and outputs go in and out of that bank account and they have a profit sharing a ratio agreed between them. Um, I suppose it's very important from day one that they have a proper profit sharing ratio established and I suppose the accountant will be the, the correct person there to discuss that with and get that set up on, on the beginning of the partnership. And, and just to jump in there, in terms of those uh, farming family partnerships that you're talking about, you know, what are the steps that you need to take to set up this sort of an arrangement? I suppose the first thing is the family need to sit down around the table and establish is this the way forward that the farm wants to go. I suppose following that consultation then they probably should uh, take on the on a, an agricultural consultant whether that be Chagas or a private consultant just to go through all the changes of the herd numbers, the entitlements, the way the farm will run down the line. But I suppose the two, two really important people are the accountant and the accountant is the person who will set up a capital account. Uh, that capital account will piece together what each of the parties will bring to the to partnership on day one. But also that accountant will register the business then with revenue and they will, will receive a tax reference number and that will be the business number that that partnership will run under. Um, I suppose the other important person maybe is the solicitor. If there is transfers of land to be done down the line or if they are completing a succession farm partnership, it will be very important to take on a solicitor to look at the legalities of the transfer down the line. And, and you mentioned, you know, sitting down and I suppose, uh, you know, having the conversation. So to take it a, a step back, I, I suppose I have a couple of questions for you. At what age do you generally see this uh, arrangement being set up between parents and, say, children? Yes, I suppose, I suppose this happens at different stages for different families. But typically what I see now is is parents maybe in their early 50s, um, they have a number of siblings who maybe still need to be put through college. They still have a long road to go themselves. They want a little bit of security. They're not sure about 100% transferring over the farm. You have a young son or daughter coming home who are well educated now at a level six, seven or eight in agriculture. They're maybe typically 24 or five. They're raring to go, uh, well educated, plenty of skills, plenty of motivation to drive on. Um, so partnerships can be a very good sort of stepping stone between uh, handing over and re relinquishing the reins, I suppose, to put it for a better word. So I suppose it's a very important conversation to have. What it does really do is that it gives the young person a sense of responsibility. It gives them a sense of ownership. They're now part of the business. They're making financial management decisions and it keeps everyone interested and it keeps the whole business moving forward. And then looking to, like you mentioned, you know, the the child in this arrangement who's stepping up and joining the business with the parents, they have brothers and sisters. Um, I suppose on this, on the, I suppose communication is important with the, with the other members of the family. Do you see this conversation happening with the arrangements you're involved in, or are they kind of left, you know, I suppose to sound a bit dramatic about it, but out in the dark? Do they know what's going on? Um, you know, should they be communicated with? Absolutely. It's a very fair question, Emma Louise, and I suppose in years gone by, it's the conversation that was never had, and that's where the problems often arose, because other mem members of the family didn't realise what was happening, and all of a the sudden they come home some weekend and they realise the older brother or sister is after getting the farm, and all hell breaks loose. So it's a very fair point, um, and I think it's a very valid one that these are the conversations, they're the hard conversations, but they're the conversations that need to take place. Um, you don't only just have the conversation with the person that's taking over the farm, but you also have the conversation with the other family members. And I think once there's a bit of buy-in from everyone, very often people actually know what's going to happen, 
but it's it's the having been part of the process and being taught of to discuss it out is what really means a lot to them. Just reading the the farmers journal a few weeks ago following a conference there was a poll done at the conference and it was you know is the successor identified you know is there worry and stress around I suppose disagreements in the future and there was still a high level of uncertainty so it is it, as you say it's an, it's a it's a sometimes a complicated conversation to have but it, it should happen. Um, getting back then to you know the profit share and the split in profits between say the parents and and m- the successor um, that that that's uh, working in the farm. What sort of profits do do people start with share wise, or you know what are you seeing typically? Yeah, well, I suppose at the end of the day, it has to work for everybody, and there has to be a little bit in it in it for everyone. It has to be a, a win win situation. And typically you will see 80, 20, 70, 30 splits, depending on what maybe the younger person is bringing to the party and, and what requirements are, are on the parents to provide for other siblings in the family. But look, over time, that, that profit sharing j- ratio generally swings around and change, changes to maybe 70, 30, 80, 20 in favour of the young person over time as, as the demands on the father and mother lessen. So moving away then from the family arrangements, what sort of arrangements and opportunities are you seeing for people with non-farming backgrounds? Yeah, look, I suppose there's a number of opportunities there is, I suppose, the in a number of cases you have people coming in as, as employees and they're, they're working they're working on large dairy herds and they're they're working their their hourly week and they're they're helping out in all aspects of the dairy farming. I suppose other opportunities there too is the long term land leasing. There's great incentives for the lessor now in leasing out land uh, once the lease is over a five year um, arrangement. It uh, can be quite an expensive option, but if there's good facilities on the farm, it, it may well be worthwhile. And I suppose everyone has to do an individual budget to see will they make it work for themselves. Share farming then is another option, I suppose, where where the, you often see an older farmer, he has no identified successor and he he's willing to step back a little bit from, from farming but doesn't want to retire. So often you'll have a young person with no access to land. They will come in there and they will use the one farm of land to generate two two sets of uh, farm accounts. Very often the the farmer will provide the land, the facilities, and the person coming in will generally supply most of the labour. Now, there can be different arrangements there, and it's very important to sit down day one and ensure that a budget is done up, that everyone can, can be viable. And and just to delve into those, um, I suppose, a few points that you've made. The employee was the typical one on farms, I suppose, prior to abolition of milk quota because there wasn't room for expansion. By and large, there was a successor available on, on farms. So, you know, employee was where it was at. You know, the, I suppose the maximum you could be on most farms was a manager. But to take it a step further, you know, you talked about leasing and share farming. From, uh, I suppose, a, a, the person person coming in and they typically tend to be a young person who doesn't have a farm of land uh, at home necessarily or maybe that they're not the chosen successor at home that that's going to go farming long term what is the easiest arrangement to get involved in there would it be the leasing or the share farming I suppose look at it, it, circumstances dictate different operations I suppose um, we all know that labor is difficult to source uh, land has become very difficult to source and and in some cases it beco- can become very expensive um, if you're going down the share farming route, I suppose it would be very important to know the person that you're getting in involved with, that there would be um, a bit of homework done and that you would have the knowledge that you could build up a relationship and could work with that person. Because at the end of the day, you're going in with a non-family member and you would really want to be sure that the arrangement would, would stick the test of time. And then looking at the land leasing from the leaser's perspective, what exactly is the benefits there for them to be gained from leasing? Like you're saying in an arrangement that's greater than five years. Yes, I suppose the, the main benefits there are there's huge tax incentives there for, for anyone that's leasing out land. A five to seven year lease, you can avail of a tax free threshold of up to 18,000 per year. If the lease is over seven years, up to 10 years, you can avail of 22,500 tax free. 10 to 15 years then is 30,000 tax free and if the lease is over 15 years it's 40,000 tax free. Now if the land is in joint ownership and you have proof of that on land folios those thresholds can actually be doubled. So there is a huge tax incentive there. Then I suppose the other benefits for the lessor then as well is that 
Uh, because the leasee now has a security of tender that they will make improvements to your land, whether that be through drainage, whether it be through l- putting out lime, building soil fertility, uh, putting in farm roadways. So there will be improvements, enhancements made to your land as well because the lessee now can drive on and justify his financial investment. And I suppose the longer the lease, the more opportunity to make investment in, in farms. You know, that you know the, the person leasing the land will see that you know, I will benefit from this as well as the landowner. And then in terms of the share farming arrangement, in the share farming arrangement, what is the typical breakdown? Uh, you know, what proportion goes to the landowner and what proportion goes to the share milker? Yeah, I, su- I suppose it's very hard to put a, f- a figure on that, um, Emma Louise. It's going to come down to every individual situation. is going to be different depending on what each person is bringing to the table. As Each person needs to sit down and do their own budget to ensure that it will work for them. And as I said before, it needs to be a win-win situation. Um, There's no point in one person getting the upper hand in this and having a winner and a loser. Both people have to be able to generate a financial a plan that will support their family and their their needs. In terms then of the, you know say they there's often a percentage put on um on the value of land labor facilities and the cows and you know if you had if you were bringing if the farm owner had the land the facilities and the cows you know you're kind of given a 25% value to all of those I suppose pieces of the jigsaw and then if the share milker or the share farmer was bringing the labour as themselves and, and others that would be the other 25% is th- are those percentages uh, changing any bit you know in light of the lack of labour and, and, and maybe the share farmer having to bring investment in facilities? I suppose they were very simple breakdowns of figures that have have been done in the past, but I suppose it really comes down to the scale of the operation. Like if you're going into a a 100 cow herd versus a 300 cow herd, those those, uh, percentages could be very different figures. So I suppose, again, coming back to it, it's very hard to put just a generic figure for each farm. I think everyone has to take it on its own merits and bring it down to an individual basis. And every, every person needs to do their own budget. We, we've talked through the advantages of looking at uh, long-term leasing as a landowner. Are there any main major advantages of a share farming arrangement for a landowner? I suppose the, the advantage of the share farming arrangement for the landowner is that if he hasn't an, an identified successor or maybe he has a successor who's not ready to come home, that it can be a sort of a stepping stone again that he doesn't want to to give up on dairy farming but feels that he doesn't have enough labour and um, he doesn't have enough time for his own family commitments. It is bringing in another person, uh, it's sharing the workload. Uh, while it's sharing the workload it's also sharing the profits as well but it could be a way to keep a farm going for a number of years until a successor or an, an identified successor is ready to take over. And then, like, finally, if we were to look um, and put ourselves in the shoes for, for these non-family arrangements, put ourselves in the shoes of maybe the young person coming in and then the older person who doesn't necessarily have a successor or, like you mentioned, the successor isn't ready to come home. Firstly, for the, the farm owner, what are they looking for in a young person coming into these sort of arrangements? Well, I suppose they want to see someone that's coming in that has a bit of knowledge, that, that knows what he's doing, uh, someone with a bit of enthusiasm and drive. And I suppose someone has a bit of focus and that's, that's willing and that has a bit of a plan that sort of knows what he wants, where he's going and how he's going to get there. So I suppose that he can justify taking him in and he knows that the farm is going to move forward and, and will be progressive. And then, uh, by the same token, what are young people looking for? Yeah, well, I suppose from the young person's point of view, they want to come into a farm that has has got reasonable level of facilities. I suppose that they have a decent uh, land block in terms of having a sustainable milking platform, the facilities in terms of the parlour, the cubicles, the slurry storage, that, that they're all up to speed, I suppose, in terms that there won't be massive investment needed and that they can get going pretty quickly and start generating uh, income from, from day one. And then finally, when when we look to non-farming arrangements, are we looking at similar people to get involved in the setup of these arrangements? Are we looking to the ag consultant, the accountant, the solicitor? Yeah, look, I think uh, 
any prudent planning would have a financial uh, advice got you would take on an accountant there to make sure that all taxation issues were in place that the budgets were in order and you would also take on legal advice i suppose to ensure that the arrangements were were all set on sound footing and I suppose the important thing is to have a relationship with the person that you're going into and, and sit down and have a good chat with him to ensure that everyone is on the same page of the book and that everyone is willing to progress the business and that, that everyone is, is willing to move forward. And I think just to, to sum up, Gordon, um, from, I suppose, talking through all of the different types of arrangements, the communication piece is very important. And you mentioned the relationship, whether it is with family members or you're looking, you know, to, I suppose, strangers who you're getting involved with, with a farm business and, uh, you know, having the conversation, making sure the lines are clear in terms of, you know, what are what's the plan and what are the rules and you know getting help from outside people to to ensure the plan is you know materialized yeah no absolutely communication is is king really and i suppose there's no point in having these conversations when the thing goes wrong it's to sit down and have these conversations beforehand and try out iron out any little difficulties that you can see arising and talk keep talking that's great thank you gordon thanks emma louise that's it for this week's episode of the dairy edge podcast And my thanks to Gordon Peppard for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.